Ephesians chapter 5, we'll begin reading here in the verse 18 in a moment. And I've been journeying through this book of Ephesians. And uh, this morning's message is going to be a little bit of a teachy type message uh, for a little bit here. Uh, to try to clear up some confusion, and you'll know what I mean as I get into it. So, Ephesians chapter 5, when you find it, if you're able to stand, please stand with me. If you need to remain seated, please do so, but follow along as we read. Ephesians chapter 5, we'll just read three verses this morning. Notice we read in verse 18, And be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's enough there. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you again for the opportunity to be here this morning. And Father, we've come here this morning because you've commanded us to gather together in your name. You told us to not forsake the assembling of ourselves together. And Lord, you've also said when two or three are gathered in your name, there you would be in the midst of us. So I pray this morning that we would all sense your presence in a special way. We pray, Lord, that your word would go forth with power this morning in clarity. Lord, we are your sheep. We need to be fed and we know the food is the word of God. So please give us exactly what we need this morning. Again, I ask that you'd remove any distractions from this room and from our minds this morning. And may our hearts and minds be fixed upon thee. Please fill me afresh and anew with thy spirit as we all recognize without you we can do nothing. We need thee. Bless this time. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. On April 2nd, 2010, now the next two words I'm going to say is going to give you an idea of where we're headed with this message. Benny Hinn had what he called his Good Friday Miracle Service in Atlanta, Georgia. It was said to be, quote, a Holy Spirit anointing service. Now, during that service, a lot of things happened. But as the people stood, Benny Hinn, of course, as he usually is, I'm told, uh, dressed in white, uh, would take off his jacket, of course, as the music in the service was pulsating and the choir was singing. He'd walk around towards the front row of the assembly, taking that jacket and waving it across over their heads, and he'd shout the words out, Take a fresh breath! of the Spirit. And as his jacket waved in the air, the first two or three or four rows of people would just fall back. (laughs) I mean like dominoes. Just straight back. Some of them to the ground, others into the laps of people behind them. After doing this, of course, several times, the music is still pulsating. Uh, uh, Some of his workers, uh, two at a time, would bring up people to the stage, and that worker would have the microphone as this mayhem is going on, and here comes uh, two workers with a person in between, helping that person to Benny Hinn, and the worker, through the microphone, would shout out, Lupus! And Benny Hinn would put his hands on their necks, uh, uh, pushing uh, them back to the ground and shout out, The pain is gone! Of course, he'd get back up and he'd do it again. Why, if the pain's gone? But anyway, (laughs) another one would come up and the worker would shout out, Cancer! Same thing, hands on the neck, pushing to the ground into the arms of those workers, shouting out, the pain is gone. 
Another worker said, Joshua, 15 years old, he was in a fire when he was three. He cannot speak correctly and has stuttered for 13 years. Again, hands on the neck, pressing back. It's all healed. Tumor, the next one, hands on the neck, disappeared, they shout out. A stroke, the pain is gone. Benny Hinn would repeatedly say, you have been anointed by the Spirit. Really? You know when some people swallow that? That's a lie. You know, Benny Hinn's not the only person who's confused about the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. Many people are confused. Many churches are confused. Many church members can be slightly confused. Uh, even preachers are confused. Some will claim that it is the Holy Spirit that causes things like uncontrollable laughter involuntary jerking and shaking, a drunk-like stumbling. They say it's the Holy Spirit uh, uh, that uh, knocks people over in the service uh, and causes people to uh, utter unintelligible gibberish. And I want to ask us this morning, is that really the Holy Spirit? Not according to the Bible. Not according to God's word. Now remember the Bible is not everything that God knows. But it is everything that God wants us to know. Everything is found in his word. And it's everything that you and I need to know about God, about salvation, about heaven, about hell, about life here on earth, about what is right and wrong. Everything we need to know is found in God's word. 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. Jesus himself said in John 17.17, 17, sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. We read in Acts chapter 17, uh, these were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness of mind. Watch this. And search the scriptures daily whether those things were so. You see, the Jews in Berea were complimented because they did not just accept anything that anybody said or did. They searched the scriptures to verify everything that they were being told. And that's the way it's supposed to be. Ben Bogard said this, uh, uh, quote, By the scriptures, the all-sufficient rule of faith and practice, must every doctrine and every truth be tried by the Bible. So if we want to know about the Holy Spirit of God, we do not listen to the opinions of men. We do not rely upon the experiences of people. We go directly to the Word of God. Now, notice what Paul says here in verse 18 of our text. We read, And be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, here it is, but be filled with the Spirit. Notice the command, not a suggestion. Be filled with the Spirit. What does that mean? What does that mean? Be filled with the Spirit. This morning I'd like to preach on that very topic, and here's the title of the message, Being Filled with the Spirit. Now, for the past four, well, the past chapter and a half, since chapter four, the Apostle Paul has been penning these words to this church at Ephesus. This is written to believers, and he has been instructing them on the importance of living the Christian life. Now understand there is a vast difference between becoming a Christian and living the Christian life. They're not the same. There's a difference. You see, to become a Christian, by the way, nobody's born a Christian, amen? I think we learned in Sunday school we're all children of the devil by nature. 
But to become a Christian is rather simple. It really is. We must first recognize our condition before God, that we are sinners, lost, guilty before a holy God, that we are justly destined for an eternal hell, justly deserving of an eternal hell because of our sin. By the way, that describes all of us. We all are there. We started that way. Ecclesiastes 7.20 For there is not a just man upon the earth that doeth good and sinneth not. You may say, well, that's not me. I don't sin. Oh, yes, we do. We all do. Maybe to different degrees and different amounts, but we all sin. 1 John 1, 1.8 If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. By the way, sinning does not make us sinners. We sin because we are sinners. You see, we're all born sinners, separated from God. But then we have to realize that God loves us. And he did something for us. God came to this earth in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. He went to the cross of Calvary, and God the Father took all the sins of the world, yours and mine, and he laid them upon Jesus Christ. And when he shed his blood, he was paying for the sins of the entire world, every one of them, uh, he bore our sin debt. He shed his blood for us. But in order to become a Christian, you must simply repent of your sin. In other words, realizing that it is your sin that is separating you from God and that we deserve hell and then receive Jesus Christ as our personal Savior. And the moment that we do that, all of our sins are forgiven and we have an eternal home in heaven. Amen. Praise God for that. Imagine for a moment, you and I don't have to do anything to earn our way to heaven. We can't do anything to earn our way to heaven. We must simply receive Jesus Christ as our Savior. Simply put in Romans 10, 13, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So becoming a Christian is that simple. I hope you're here today and you're saved. If not, you can be saved today. We can help you at the end of the service. But living the Christian life, on the other hand, well, that's a whole different story. That's not as simple. You see, to truly live the Christian life, to, to be a true disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ, to, to be a true follower of Christ, uh, there are some pretty steep requirements. By the way, the Lord Jesus Christ spoke of them in Luke chapter 14. Read through that and you'll get an idea of the requirements. But really the primary requirement, the one that sums it up, is really what we find in our text. It's right here. And that is to be filled with the Holy Spirit of God. Do you want to live the Christian life? Do I want to live the Christian life? We must be filled with the Spirit. So again, I'm back to that question. What does that mean? Let's well, see if I can't explain that this morning in the few moments that we have. Notice number one, the comprehending of the Holy Spirit. You know, one of the most misunderstood and misapplied doctrine in the Bible is the doctrine of the Holy Spirit of God. Uh, the theological term is pneumatology. But what does the Bible teach about the Holy Spirit of God? Who is the Holy Spirit of God? And what is His purpose? Well, the Holy Spirit of God is the third person of the Godhead. He is God. You say, wait a minute, what do you mean? Well, we believe in one God, amen? 1 Corinthians 8, 4, we know that an idol is nothing in the world and that there is none other God but one. We get that. There is only one true and living God. That's it. There's not three, there's one. There's not a hundred, there's one. All other gods, small g gods, aside from him, are false gods. But our one God manifests himself in three distinct yet coexisting and co-functioning persons. And that is uh, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Now, 1 John 5, 7 makes this truth clear. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. You say, wait a minute, preacher. Three, one, one, three. Which is it? It's one manifested in three persons. Now, a very simplistic yet somewhat deficient way of trying to describe this would be like this. I am one person. Amen? Maybe a little schizophrenic. No, no, one person. But I am a husband. 
I am a father and I'm a grandfather all at the same time, right? Sometimes I'm honey. <laughs> sometimes I'm dad. And sometimes I'm poppy. But they're all me. And they're different roles I have. Uh, so that's kind of the idea. So understand, the, the, the Holy Spirit of God is God manifesting himself in the person of the Holy Spirit. Now, the Holy Spirit of God has some very distinct ministries, or we could say purposes, that he performs. He both works in the life of the unbeliever, and he works in the life of the believer. Let's look at them both for a moment. Let's look at first his ministry in the life of the unbeliever. Now turn with me to John chapter 16. John chapter 16. How does the Holy Spirit work in the life of an unbeliever? Well, we find it here. Jesus telling his disciples. John 16 and verse 7. Notice we read, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. Watch this. And when he is come, he will, notice the phrase, reprove the world. Unbelievers. Reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin, because they believe not on me. Of righteousness, because I go to my Father, and ye see me no more. Of judgment, because the prince of this world is judge. So it is the Holy Spirit of God that convicts or causes guilt, if you will, in the lost man. He convicts him of his sin. He convicts him that he is lost. He convicts him that his life falls short of God's standards and that he's not good enough to get to heaven and that he needs Jesus Christ as his Savior and that he will stand before God one day that in judgment. That is the work of the Holy Spirit. Again, as a, as a person hears preaching or a soul winner comes to that person, talks to them about the Lord, gives them Bible verses, what is happening is the Spirit of God, as you are saying the Word of God, the Spirit of God is convicting that person of their condition. That's what he does. Do you remember when the people in Jerusalem heard the preaching of the gospel in Acts chapter 2? Listen to what we read. In Acts 2.37, now when they heard this, watch this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? They were convicted of what he was saying. That was the work of the Holy Spirit. When the Sanhedrin, the Jewish council, heard the preaching of Peter in Acts chapter 5, we read this, when they heard that, they were cut to the heart. That was the work of the Holy Spirit of God. Do you remember the story of the Philippian jailer in Acts chapter 16, verse 29 and 30? Then he called for a light and sprang in and came trembling and fell down before Silas, uh, Paul and Silas and brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? What was happening here? It is the work of the Holy Spirit in the heart of the unbeliever convicting them of their condition. You see, it's the Holy Spirit of God that testifies of the Lord Jesus Christ and the gospel. John 15, 26. But when the Comforter is, is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, which proceedeth from the Father, he shall testify of me. So again, as the word of God is read or preached or heard uh, to a lost person, they feel that conviction, that guilt, uh, and they're being convinced that they need to be saved. That is the work of the Holy Spirit of God in the life of the unbeliever. Maybe you're here today and you've heard some of the things I said about the gospel and you're not saved. And the Holy Spirit of God right now is working on you saying, you know what? I'm not saved. You know what? I'm a sinner. You know what? I deserve God's punishment. That is the Spirit of God trying to convince you to be saved so that you might come to know Jesus Christ as your Savior. Uh, don't fight it. Amen. Receive the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. That's why he's talking to you that way. So again, there's a work of the Holy Spirit in the life 
of the, belie- of the unbeliever. But then there's a work of the Spirit of God in the life of the believer. Maybe you're here today and you say, well, I'm saved, so how does the Spirit of God work in me? Well, let me explain that as well. In New Testament times, the moment that a person gets saved, the Holy Spirit of God takes up residence inside that person. He indwells that person. He comes to live, the Spirit of God comes to live inside the saved person's spirit. You see, that's what Jesus Christ told his disciples uh, that would happen. You're in John chapter 16, or I believe, turn back a page or two, and look at John chapter 14. And look at verse 16. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. Even the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But ye know him, here it is, for he dwelleth in you and shall be in you. So the moment a person gets saved, the Spirit of God indwells that believer. Remember what Paul said to the believers at Corinth in 1 Corinthians 3.16. He said, Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? Again, this is not a, you say, I didn't feel anything. It's not a feeling. Though we do sense his presence, it's not a feeling. It's a fact. It's a fact. And this indwelling that I'm speaking of this morning is referred to in Scripture as the baptism of the Holy Spirit, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, or the anointing of the Holy Spirit. So when a person gets saved, they are indwelt or baptized or anointed by the Holy Spirit of God. Again, it happens at the moment of salvation. Romans 9, 8 and verse 9 says this, But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. It's plain as day. So if you're here today and you are saved, understand something, the Spirit of God dwells inside of you. If you're here today and you're not saved, then the Spirit of God does not dwell inside of you. It is really that simple. Now, the Holy Spirit of God has many ministries. He dwells in us, and he has many ministries in the life of the believer. For example, he convicts us as well when we're doing wrong. He convicts us of sin. It's that guilt that you and I feel, that voice that we hear inside of us, if you will, uh, that, that speaks to us about things. He confirms also things that are right. He also leads us. If you're in a place where you have to make a decision in life, maybe it's about a job or something to do, he leads us into making biblical decisions. He also gives us wisdom. He tells us what to do every day in life. He tells us what to do in ministry. He tells us how to handle things with people uh, at our job or at home or at church. He corrects us when we get off course. He warns us when we're about to do something wrong. This is his ministry. Imagine for a moment, here you are walking through life. Paul talked again and again about the walk of the Christian. And here we are trying to follow the Lord and do the right thing. And there are times where we start to head in a wrong direction. Or we start to do something. We're tempted and we head in a sinful direction. And we hear that voice or feel that feeling of, Uh, don't do that. You need to stop. That's wrong. That's the Holy Spirit of God. He helps us that way. If we're here praying about things, now right or wrong, those are easy decisions to make because we just look at the Bible. I can't do that. It's wrong according to God's Word. I can do this because it's right according to God's Word. But you know that within right sometimes, there's several decisions to make. Uh, Maybe it's a job situation and you're thinking, huh, okay, what job do I take? Well, it doesn't miss uh, church, so this one could be, but this one too, I don't miss church. And I can serve the Lord with both of these, and I can live for God while doing both of these jobs. And they're not jobs that deal with sinful activities like uh, gambling or whatever it may be. Uh, And so here you have two or three jobs. How do you know which one to take? The Spirit of God. 
You pray and ask God to lead you and direct you. And by the way, the leadership of the Spirit of God will never contradict His Word. Sometimes people say, well, I feel led of God to do this. But the Bible says you're not supposed to do that. Well, God led me to do this. No, He didn't. You're leading yourself. And so that's the ministry of the Spirit of God. He's there to lead us. By the way, he does it, again, by speaking to our hearts. Sometimes it's through preaching he speaks to us. Sometimes it's through reading our Bible. Sometimes it's cir uh, circumstances. But understand something. He wants to do this every day, every moment of our lives. Not just on Sunday. Not just during church times. Every day of our lives. He gives us his spirit for that reason. Romans 8.14 says this, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Galatians 4.6, And because ye are sons, God hath sent forth the Spirit of his Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So I hope this morning that clarified a little bit about what the Holy Spirit or who He is. He is God in the third person of the Godhead. He works in the life of unbelievers. When you get saved, He indwells you and me. And He's there for so many things. But in general, to lead us, direct us, correct us, all of that, that's what He's doing in our hearts. So number one, the comprehending of the Holy Spirit. Now let's go back to our text. Ephesians chapter 5, and look at number 2, the command to be filled with the Holy Spirit. So I understand, as you say, preacher, you just explained what it means to be anointed with the Holy Spirit. I know the charismatics have used that word in a perverted way, if you will. And so we kind of go, ooh, anointed. No, it means to indwell us. That's all it means. The baptism of the Holy Spirit. Uh, but here we read this command. Paul tells believers. He's telling church members. He's telling everyone that knows Christ. He says in verse 18, and be not drunk. Drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Okay, here's the question again. What does that mean? I get the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the anointing of the Holy Spirit, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. What about being filled? Well, two things about this command. Number one is explanation. Here it is. To be filled with the Holy Spirit of God is not the same as being indwelt by the Holy Spirit of God. It's not the same. Every believer is indwelt by the Holy Spirit of God. But every believer is not filled with the Holy Spirit of God. You see, a believer is filled with the Holy Spirit of God, watch this, when he is completely yielded to the Holy Spirit of God. When he makes Jesus Christ the Lord of every area of our life. So to be filled is to be completely yielded. When you're filled with the Spirit of God, you are empty of self. Imagine a glass, if you will. If you're filled with the Spirit, that's all that's in there. But if you're, you have self in there, that's a problem. So you're empty of yourself, your self-will, your own ideas, your own direction, and you're completely yielded to the Spirit of God. Commentator Lewis Talbot put it this way. He said, it is when the believer puts into the hands of the Spirit the keys which unlock every department of his life. That's not easy. Every department, I mean everything. How I think, where I go, what I say, what I do, what I listen to, what I put on my body. We give it all to him and let him control that area. He goes on to say, to be filled with the Spirit is not a matter of a believer's having more of the Spirit, but rather a matter of the Spirit possessing more of the believer. Did you get that? Get the CD if you didn't. Listen again. <laughs> Dr. Schindler used to always say this. I, I love this phrase. He said, being filled with the Spirit is not a matter of content, it's a matter of control. It is when you and I allow the Spirit of God who is in us and speaking to us, we allow Him to control every area of our lives. It's when we place ourselves under the complete control of Him. 
By the way, being filled with the Spirit is a moment-by-moment thing. You see, I could be filled with the Spirit one moment, and then, boy, something happens in my life, or I make a decision, or I choose something. Guess what? The next moment, I'm not filled with the Spirit of God until I yield back to Him. You see, you can be filled one moment and then not filled the next moment. And again, by the way, the opposite of being filled with the Spirit is being in the flesh. Let me show you. Hold your hand here. Go over to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. Notice verse 5, Romans chapter 8. Romans 8, 5 says this, For they, writing to believers here, For they that are after the flesh, notice, in, not in the flesh, after the flesh, but they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. Can I ask you something? What you after? Which one are you after? Are you after minding the things of the Spirit of God? Or are you after your own program, doing your own thing? You see, when we are filled with the Spirit of God, we are following His leadership. When we hear His voice, whether it be in preaching or reading our Bible, or as we do things in life, He's speaking to us. We do not ignore Him. We do not quench Him. Uh, we do not lie to Him. All things that we can do to the Holy Spirit of God. Instead, we listen to what He's saying and we yield to it in every area. That's what it means to be filled with the Spirit of God. The question is, are we? Do we even want to be? Do we even like try to hear his voice? More about that later. So we see the explanation, but go back to our text, and I want us to notice also the comparison. So again, being filled and being indwelt, totally different. Every believer has the Spirit of God. But how much does the Spirit of God have you and me? That shows if we're filled or not. So notice what he says here again in verse 18. And be, he makes a comparison. And be not drunk with wine wherein is excess. You know, this poor verse. This poor verse has been this, and I say it because of this. This, this verse has been the subject of so many people who have tried to rest the scriptures to fit their desires. This verse has, this is a whole other sermon. This verse has nothing to do with condoning the consumption of alcohol to any degree. It has nothing to do with that. This is not a doctrinal statement about what God says about drinking. Not at all. If you want to find that out, get all the scriptures on it. You'll find what God says about drinking. He says, stay away from it. Don't look it. Don't touch it. Don't serve it to anybody. See, I got down that rabbit trail anyway. <laughs> Scriptures are clear. We are to totally abstain. Now, my wife said that. I was hoping I'd get a few more amens right there. Now, let me try it again. The Scriptures say we're to totally abstain. Amen. All right, maybe half of you. All right, amen. We'll go check out your, the rest of your cabinets after the service. Amen. <laughs> Drunkenness here is simply being used as a comparison or an illustration. Let me show you what I mean. Think about a drunk person. Now, I was saved 32 years old, okay? So, been around them. I, I understand this, and, and some of you as well. We've been saved, right? Off of some pretty, yeah, anyway. A drunk person begins by deliberately choosing to drink intoxicating spirits. They choose to do it. Nobody forces you to, to bring it to your mouth. You choose to do that. He chooses to place himself under the control of that alcohol. Then when he gets drunk, what happens? His behavior changes. Now, since my wife and I have been saved, we, we still have many relatives that are unsaved. And just to be quite frank, we try to reach them. We've probably given them all the gospel during the holidays, which are coming up, Thanksgiving and Christmas, there's times they have their get-together, say, hey, come on over. And so, you know, we want to try to be a, somewhat of a light there. And it always starts out pretty good. You know, we're fellowshipping, we're having the turkey and the ham, and we're ha-ha-ha-ha, and the next thing you know, here comes the wine. 
and they start, you know, giving it out, and then they start drinking all the wine. And, and, and we know, we know, we know exactly when it's time to leave. <laughs> we love you guys so much. Have we told you lately that we loved you all so much? You know, we really need to get together a lot more. We don't do this enough. <laughs> okay. Time to go. These are not the people that were here when we got here. Somebody else has arrived. You've seen it too. What alcohol does. Uh, timid men become belligerent. Quiet people become social. Men who were hard as nails. <laughs> who is this guy? Become tearful. Moral men, moral women turned into immoral men and women. Often doing things that they would never do otherwise. Why? Because they've placed themselves under the control of that alcohol. So watch this. Be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. What he's saying here is this. Just like a man who is drunk is under the control of alcohol, a saved man should be under the control of the Holy Spirit of God. That's what he's saying here. That's nothing to do with drinking and being right. It's that comparison. He's saying here that you and I as believers, under, and by the way, the church at Ephesus, they were well aware of this. This was a licentious town. I mean, the temple of Diana filled with uh, prostitution and vulgarity and drunkenness. All, they, they understood that. They saw it. And he says this, uh, he says, uh, you should allow yourselves uh, uh, to be under the control of the Spirit of God in everything that you do. And by the way, that's the way it is for us as well. When he speaks, we should listen. When he leads, we should follow. When he convicts, we should respond. When he warns us, don't do this, don't go there, we should listen to him if we're filled with the Spirit of God. You see, the Spirit of God wants to control every area of our lives. But you know, here's how it works for probably all of us to some degree. We have the areas we let Him control, and then the areas we say, no trespassing. This is my area. Don't mess with it. Can I ask you something? What is that area in your life? Nobody's going to tell me how to talk to people. Oh, yeah. I don't have to love that person. Look what they did to me. Oh, I don't. I'll come to church Wednesday night. No. Oh, I don't. What is it? Tithing? I'm not doing that. Go ahead then. Listen, you're not, you're not hurting anybody but yourself. You get the idea of, oh, I'm not. The preacher's not telling me what to do. It's not about me. It's about God. What area is it that you have boxed off and said, no way, Jose? If you've done that, like most of us have, at least at one time or another, then at that moment, we're not filled with the Spirit of God. We're filled with ourselves. You see, this is what it means to be filled with the Spirit of God. And we're commanded. Boy, it got awful quiet in here. You know why? Because it's in all of our wheelhouses. We're, we're, that's us. So we see, number one, the comprehending of the Spirit of God. Number two, the command to be filled with the Spirit. And then last thing we're done right here, the consequences of being filled with the Spirit. So how do I know? You say, well, I'm filled with the Spirit. I know it because, because, I, because I run around the auditorium when the preacher preaches. God help us. Man, you should have seen the service, man. The Spirit of God was evident. All these people fell down and started gibberish talk. Blah, 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 blah. Boy, it was a Spirit-filled service. Oh, the preacher got loud. Boy, was he spirit-filled. Really? You know that 
Jonathan Edwards read his sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God by a Candlelight, almost monotonely, and the Spirit of God used him in a great way. He didn't allow it at all. He was filled with the Spirit of God. But how do we know? Do you know if you and I are filled with the Spirit of God, then we will display the fruit of the Spirit. You say, what's the fruit of the Spirit? Galatians 5.22, but the fruit of the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit, what it produces. Here it is. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. You know what temperance is? Self-control. Oh, the Spirit of God. Stop. That's not the Spirit of God. Notice the, the, the fruit of the Spirit's not rolling around the floor or holy laughter, or shaking, and so forth. But notice the two things in our text that he highlights. Look at verse 19. Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Here it is. According to this, a spirit-filled Christian is, number one, joyful. How are you doing today? Well, you know, you know, well, life, you know, life's just got the best of me. You're not looking at things right. You see, a spirit-filled Christian is a happy Christian. Our hearts will be overflowing with joy. There'll be a song in our hearts. We will rejoice. And if we're spirit-filled, we will rejoice in singing songs about God's love and God's grace and God's goodness and our great salvation that he gave to us. That's what happens when you're spirit-filled. Do you know when we know, when you know in your heart, and I'm not saying the outward stuff that we try to show everybody, that our lives are as best as we know how, surrendered to God. There's no unconfessed sin in our lives. We're in the will of God. We're not hiding anything. There's no double life. I live this way here and I live this way there. And we don't have any guilt about anything. You know, we're happy in Jesus when that's the case. There's no greater thing. And again, this is, we're not talking about some worked up, superficial, hypocritical joy. There's a deep-seated joy in our life when we're spirit-filled. That's what he says here. But there's another thing, number two, is, and that's in verse 20, and that is this, we're thankful. Look at this, giving thanks always for all things. That's a tough verse, isn't it? Giving thanks always for all things unto God. I just lost my job. My wife just left. She didn't. I'm just talking about somebody else. <laughs> She's right here. She's right here. Right here. My spouse just left me. My kids just took off in rebellion. How can I be thankful for that? Well, when we know God's in control, when we know that God can still put thing, anything back together, when we know that with God nothing's impossible, how do we look at our nation today and see the mess? that's going on, the lying that's going on, the deceit that's going on, the brainwashing of our children that's going on. Well, thank God for, God can still work. He can. And so we're, 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 we're thankful. Uh, we, you see, a spiritual Christian will be thankful even when things go wrong, even when, when, when injustices occur, uh, when death or sickness enters into our lives or the life of a loved one, or when someone we love uh, that's a Christian goes astray. Because we know, Romans 8, 28, that all things work together for good to them that love God. And, and we get it, although this may not have been God's will for them, God allowed it to happen, so hey, it's going to work out for good to them that love God. Yeah. Those are the two consequences, if you will, of being spirit-filled. So that's the case. Why aren't we all spirit-filled? We say, I want to be thankful. I want to be joyful. We can be. I want the peace of God. I want, I want that inner peace. We can have it. You say, how? There has to be a funeral service for self. Your way, your ideas, your plans, your thoughts must die. And the Spirit of God must lead you in everything. 
You see, the problem is this, and I'm done right here, I think. <laughs> we get the idea that we're better off if we hold back on God. I'm not like them, you know, those, those fools that tithe. <laughs> I keep my money. I'm not like those fools who are Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. I got a life. I got my fishing and my hunting and all that. I'm not like them dummies praying together on Wednesday night. Can I ask you something? Who's the dummy? Who's really the dummy? You know, Jesus said in Matthew 10, 39, he that findeth his life shall lose it. And he that loses his life for my sake shall find it. You see, we think we keep it and we're better off. He says, no, no, no. You give it to me. And you yield your life to me. You let me, even though you may not understand what I'm commanding you, you just do it. And you yield to me. You're going to find something. You're going to find life. You're going to find the best life you could ever have. The abundant life that he promised. But it's all rooted in this one thing. Be filled with the Spirit of God. Can I ask you this morning, is there some area in your life no trespassing? Stay off. Private property? Leave it alone. Nobody's messing with that. Nobody's messing with the music I listen to. Nobody's messing with my Sunday nights. Nobody's messing with the way I deal with things. You're the most miserable person in the entire world is a saved person that's not yielded to God. Right there. Sometimes worse than a lost person. I've seen happier lost people than some people that are saved and just trying to do their own thing. Listen, being filled with the Spirit is something that's good for us. It's something we ought to do. And when we do it, we're going to find the joy and the peace and the abundant life that Jesus Christ promised. Let's pray together.